I am a perpetual traveler through the Bible. Please join me for the next part of my journey through the Scriptures. Stay as long as you like, and let us together discover a bit more about the Bible. There is a good reason why the book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible. If you have read the rest of the Bible, before you come to Revelation, you will be so much better equipped to understand the climax of the entire revelation of God to His people. The book of Revelation is a prophetic book. Revelation chapter 1 verse 3 says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. So this is a book that deals in predictions. It deals with people and events which lie in the future. Christ and His church, Christ in His church, and Christ speaking to His church. In Acts chapter 19 we are told that Paul founded the church in Ephesus and it states in Acts 19 verses 10, the church spread throughout all of Asia Minor. Seven of these churches are mentioned in Revelation chapters 2 and 3. Some 30 years had passed since the founding of these churches, and these churches had settled into certain kinds of personalities or character, and differed from each other in various ways. At the very end of the first century, Jesus writes letters to each of these seven churches by Revelation to John and John writes them down as a portion of the book of Revelation, along with all the rest of his visions. Each of these churches mentioned in chapters 2 and 3 was a real church, in a real place. Each of these churches had particular characteristics and needs. When John wrote the book of Revelation while he was in exile on the island of Patmos, the entire church was under severe persecution. So here are seven churches living in a hostile world, under persecution with a character that developed in their own unique situation. The Lord Jesus recognizes the character of each church, the issues in each church, and sends a letter to each. These are unique churches, and yet they are the kinds of churches that exist in all periods of time, including today. So, these churches are timeless, and they have literally spoken to every generation from the first century to this present one. They will continue to be read and preached and understood by every generation until the end of the age. We are now looking at the fifth of the seven letters to the churches, which is the letter to the church at Sardis. This is a gloomy and heartbreaking letter to a very gloomy and heartbreaking church because this church, according to Jesus, is dead. At the end of Revelation 3 verse 1, Jesus says, You have the reputation of being alive but you are dead. This has to be the ultimate shame, to have the Lord Jesus himself declare that you are dead. By definition, the church is a place where God lives, a place where Christ lives, a place where the Holy Spirit lives, a place where Christians are alive, but not in this church. This church had a reputation that it was alive, but in fact it was dead. Astronomers tell us that the light from the nearest star to the sun Proxima Centauri takes four and a quarter years to reach the Earth. What that means is that Proxima Centauri could have already stopped shining four years ago, yet its light would still be visible on Earth. It would be shining in the sky tonight as brightly as if nothing had happened. It could be a dead star, but for over four years we wouldn't know it was dead. The church at Sardis was like that. It had a reputation. It had a name. The name and reputation seemed to say that it was alive. It was shining solely by the light of its brilliant past, but in the present it was dead. The city of Sardis was once one of the greatest cities of the ancient world. It was situated about 48 kilometers southeast of Thyatira. It was once the capital of the ancient kingdom of Lydia, and in the 6th century BC it was ruled by an extremely wealthy king named Cretius. The city Sardis was built on a mountain spur about half a kilometer above the valley floor. It was regarded as virtually impregnable to any military assault. Several times armies had tried to defeat Sardis but were unable to do so. Only twice in its history Sardis had fallen, once to the Persians and once to the Greeks, and both times the victories were achieved by stealth. Sardis was so confident that it could not be conquered that it failed to guard its walls adequately. In the dead of the night, a band of soldiers climbed up the sides of the ravine and entered into an unwatched gate and overthrew the city. 
So Sardis was a city characterized by a complacent attitude. The church in the city was also guilty of being complacent, and was the least attractive of the seven churches to whom these letters are written, because our Lord finds nothing to commend about it. Jesus writes the following to the church in Sardis in Revelation 3 verses 1. And to the angel of the church in Sardis write, The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. It is important to remember that in each of the letters of the seven churches, the way the Lord presents himself to the churches is a clue as to what the church needs. Here Jesus calls himself the one who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. These symbols appear in the first chapter of Revelation and are explained there. The seven spirits are a symbol of the Holy Spirit in his fullness. So what this church at Sardis desperately needed was the Spirit, or life by the Spirit. They needed to remember that Jesus is Lord of his church. It is never the church members that run the church, that set up its government, or determine what its ministry is. It is the sole right and function of the Lord Jesus himself. The seven stars mentioned in this verse are symbolic of the seven heavenly beings or angels or messengers responsible for guiding the human leadership of each church. In some theological circles, this star or angel or messenger was thought to be a reference to the pastor of the church. But since all of the churches of the New Testament never had a single human leader, and leadership was always found in the plural, that is, elders and pastors of the church, we would have to concede that the seven stars referred to the angels of the church. These are the truths that had been forgotten in Sardis. In all of these seven letters, the life of the church is always revealed in its deeds. Jesus says, as he does in most of the letters, I know your works, or I know your deeds. In Sardis, these were works that were done to impress people. This church had a good reputation and a name to live, but it was actually a dead church. The members of the church were probably for the most part not even believers, because they were not spiritually alive. Born-again believers are always spiritually alive. I suppose the members of the church in Sardis were what we would call nominal Christians today. Nominal comes from the word name, someone who has the name for something. I paraphrase what the Lord Jesus declares. You have a name to live, but you are not alive. You are dead. This indicates that the church was made up of people who outwardly professed Christ, and many of them thought that they were believers, but they actually possessed no spiritual life. They were Christians in name only. There are thousands of churches just like that all around the world today. This is why the church today is often accused of being hypocritical. We cannot reach the world for Christ because non-believers see the works, they hear the wonderful words, but there is no life in them. There is nothing behind the facade. Hollywood has given us a name for people like that. It calls them zombies, corpses that are alive, that walk about as though they were living, but they are really dead. As we read this letter, we are looking at Sardis, the church of the zombies. Apparently, there was a time when this church was alive. It had been filled with people who knew the Lord, and because they knew Him, they served and met the needs of the city inhabitants. That is the way they achieved a reputation. They appeared to be a people committed to good works, but now there was no life there. I will remind you of what Paul writes about this very aspect in 1 Corinthians 13 verses 1 to 2. He says, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have all the faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Sardis was a church that had, at one time, a great ministry, but it had slipped away from them. It once had much impact in the city of Sardis, but now nothing is happening. This church in Sardis was so devoid of life that it actually had no struggles going on within it. Notice the difference between it and other churches mentioned in Revelation. 
There are no Jewish persecutors of this church, even though there was a large colony of Jews in the city of Sardis. They ignore the church, or perhaps they didn't even know of his existence. There were no false prophets there. There were no corrupting Nicolaitans who needed to be guarded against. There were no female seducers, like the church at Thyatira faced. Apparently, there was nothing. So that was the ministry of the church at Sardis. Nothing. At this point, you might be quite anxious. You perhaps see the same signs at your own church as Sardis manifested, and you might be asking yourself, what does a dead church need? We need to remember that Jesus is still the owner of this church. He does not say, I will have nothing to do with you. Jesus always gives them a way of recovery, and he still reveals himself as Lord of the church. Let us look at these steps to recovery. They will also help us to identify a condition of death in any church. Revelation 2 verses 2 to 3 tells us, Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you have received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. So the first thing a dead church needs is to wake up. The first need of a church that is dying or dead is to become conscious of its condition. These words in Greek are staccato commands. They are sharp words, like a slap in the face, and are designed to shock and to wake up. This is very similar to the Greek used by Paul in Ephesians 5 verses 14. Anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper! and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This was the need of the church here in Sardis. Jesus is saying, wake up. We need to ask ourselves, what has gone wrong? Why are our services so dreary, so dull, and so unattractive? Why do people not want to come to our services? A church in this state needs to ask itself some very serious, sobering, honest questions. Secondly, this church must Strengthen what remains. What is that? Jesus had already told them what there was of value in the church. He says, I know your works. There were good works, but they were incomplete. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Their works were incomplete, unfinished. Their actions were right, but their motives were wrong. They were not doing them for the right reason. Here is a church that is busy doing things, but doing them to impress people. They were concerned as to where the people around would see and know what they were doing. But Jesus says even those good deeds were about to die. Strengthen them, he says, by putting their motives right. Throughout scripture, we are told that God does not judge the things that we do, but the reason we do them. He sees the motives of our hearts. He judges whether our work is done out of love for Him and gratitude for what He has done for us without caring whether people see them or not, and whether we are praised for them or not. Things should be done because we want to please God. What the church at Sardis needed to do was to understand the meaning of doing things for the Lord's sake or as unto the Lord. Thirdly, they needed to remember then what you received and heard, keep it and repent. At this particular point, most translations of the Bible, including the English Standard Version that I am quoting from, are not accurate. They translated the verse as, Remember then what you received and heard. But, in the original Greek, it is not what, but how. In other words, remember then how you have received and heard. What the believers in Sardis had received and heard, of course, was the Gospel. They had heard the message of Jesus But the most important thing was, how did it come to them? What Jesus is referring to is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus is the one who holds the seven spirits. When these people had first heard the gospel, they had heard it by the Spirit. The word came to them in the power of the Spirit. How do you take hold of the Spirit? How do you bring the Spirit's life back into the church which has the gospel? Scripture only suggests one way. It is very simple. In the second half of verse 3, it says, Repent. Repent. Look at yourself and see your wrong attitudes 
your wrong perceptions, your self-value as unacceptable before God, and do what repentance is, to change your direction and to change your mind. Then, of course, believe. You must trust in the grace of Jesus. Let His word of grace take deep root in your heart, and He promises to impart to you the life of the Spirit of God. True repentance always brings about conversion, and always allows the Spirit to impart the life of Christ. This is why Jesus says to the church at Sardis, Remember then what you received and heard, keep it and repent. That is the place of a new beginning. The fourth thing that they needed was to rediscover the hope of the Lord's return. Revelation 3 verses 3 says, If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Sardis was a church that had lost its expectation of that coming of Christ. They didn't need to be reminded of his visible appearing in glory to establish his kingdom when every eye shall see him. This is described in the first chapter of Revelation, verses 7. They needed to be reminded of that aspect of his second coming that Jesus described in Matthew 24, verses 43. But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have left his house to be broken into. Jesus says here that he will come suddenly, without warning, like a thief comes to steal away the treasure of a home. A thief or burglar never announces his coming. He comes silently and takes what he wants and then disappears again. This is how the coming of the Lord, or the word parousia in Greek, that is described in Matthew 24 verses 43, will begin. Jesus will take his church suddenly out of the world and it will disappear from the world's sight. Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 51 to 53. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. Now the word parousia is one of those strange Greek words that doesn't have any equivalent word in English that fully describes its true meaning. In Greek, parousia basically means presence. In ancient Greek, it also had the meaning of an arrival, or an occasion, or a visit by a high official. Perhaps the best way to describe it is the feeling you would have if you were to be unexpectedly visited by the Queen of England. You might not see her or speak to her, but you would be aware of her presence and the atmosphere of being in the presence of someone important. Jesus promises his coming, or parousia, as the unique hope of the church. The church is really an unappreciated treasure of the world, but the Lord will come as a thief and take it to himself. In theological terms, this is also called the rapture of the church. In my mind, the departure of the church is perhaps a better term than rapture. When the Lord comes as a thief, the members of the church who are not believers, who have the reputation of being alive, but have no spiritual life, they will be left behind. Thus our Lord warns the church of Sardis here, If you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. There are many churches like this today throughout the world, not only the Roman Catholic Church or the Evangelical Church, but many Pentecostal churches as well. If we look prophetically at Sardis, there is a period of church history which was predominantly characterized by Sardis conditions. This was the period from the last half of the 16th century, after the Reformation, to about the middle of the 18th century, which was the beginning of the Evangelical Awakening in Europe and America. The Reformation, of course, was a time when the church came out of death into life. Luther and his contemporaries discovered the great truth of justification by faith alone and began to preach throughout Europe. This good news spread like wildfire throughout the nations of northern Europe. This good news spread quickly, but it only lasted a relatively short time. You might wonder why the great fires of the Reformation began to cool so quickly after the Reformers had gone. The Reformers made a fatal error. They began to link the oversight and leadership of the church with the government of the country in which they lived. Luther did it by asking the German princes for protection against the power of Rome. 
Zwingli made the same mistake in Switzerland because he was associated with the government of the country and brought the churches under his oversight into a direct tie with the state. Calvin did it in Geneva when he sought to turn the city into a theocracy. When churches rely on the protection and the sponsoring of the state, it ultimately drains the gospel of its spiritual power. Man's government and man's power usurps the power and the work of the Holy Spirit, and men begin to rely on themselves rather than on God, just like the church in Sardis. This is still widely true in Europe and South Africa today. Churches in both regions are almost empty. There may be a few believers among those present, but the membership of the church is made up of people who have the reputation of a name, but are spiritually dead. The letter to the church at Sardis is not all bad news. There is a promise given to those individuals who are faithful to the Lord, even the dead church, in verses 4 to 6. Yet you still have a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. White garments are always in Scripture a symbol of redemption. Later, in Revelation 7, verses 14, it states that, White garments are a sign of being redeemed, being saved by the grace of God. Isaiah 1, verses 18 says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. That is what the blood of the Lamb does. These are worthy not because they have lived good moral lives, but because they have washed away their sins by the blood of the Lamb. They were worthy because God had imparted to them the righteousness of Christ. That is the gift which He gives to all of us who come to Him by faith. We no longer need to try to work our way into a good relationship with God. We can never do so, but you are given it by believing His word and receiving His forgiveness. The conquerors who are mentioned in verse 5 are promised three specific things. Firstly, they will be dressed in white, that is, they will be given Jesus' own righteousness. Secondly, he promises, I will never blot his name out of the book of life. Now that promise has bothered many believers because they think that that implies that some people can be blotted out of the book of life and lose their salvation. Just to reassure anyone who is bothered by that doubt, notice the way Jesus states it. He does not say anything about anyone's name being blotted out. His words are simply assuring that those who trust him will never be blotted out. Jesus is addressing the fears of the redeemed. Many Christians are troubled by the thought that perhaps they can lose their salvation. Sometimes when we have misbehaved badly, when we have done things we are ashamed of, we ask ourselves, what has happened to me? Am I no longer a Christian? Have I lost my salvation? Many believers are often troubled by such thoughts. Jesus knows that, and here he is reassuring us that if we are really a believer, if we have come to Christ, if we have been born again, and have Christ's life in us, he will never blot out our name from the book of life. The word never in Greek is the strongest negative in the Greek language. It should be translated, I will never, ever, under any circumstances, blot out your name from the book of life. Thirdly, Jesus says, I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. Jesus also says this in Matthew 10 verses 26 to 27, and again in Matthew 10 verses 32 to 33. In heaven, no part of anyone's life can be hidden away. We know the truth is about ourselves that we do not want known. Here Jesus is saying, When you stand here with your entire life exposed for everyone to see, I will look at you and say, You are mine. I will acknowledge your name before the Father and all his angels. This sinner, this unworthy character, I want the universe to know, he is mine. The last word to the church at Sardis is the same as all the other six letters. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Christ said it. John wrote it. The angel delivered it. 
and the Holy Spirit is impressing it to our hearts and says, Listen and obey what Jesus says to this and all the churches. At the conclusion of this podcast, I will leave you with this question to ask yourself now. Are we striving to learn the true Christianity as taught and practiced by the early church? And as we learn it, are we living it? In other words, do we have the life of Christ within us? This is David Wiles, your fellow traveler in Christ, and this has been the Journey Through the Scriptures podcast, episode 25.